I guess we better get going. Good evening. Good to be out here with you tonight. Glad it's warm in the church building. Thank you, Jerry. My parents were without power for two days down in Texas. They got power back today. It, it went out for them about midnight or 1 a.m. or something like that Monday morning. Laura's family down in Tyler, Texas, they were without power for at least a day and a half. Um, so we're counting our blessings up here where, you know, it's balmy and, and we've got electricity. So, uh, but keep those folks in your prayers, uh, folks around the country that are struggling with, uh, with power outages and cold weather and things they don't normally uh, have to struggle with is not as much as we do up here anyway. Um, a few announcements before we begin tonight. Um, as was mentioned Sunday, Sandy Sparks uh, was not feeling well. I don't have an update on her, but uh, her family was struggling through some stomach virus issues, so let's keep Sandy in our prayers. Uh, also, keep Jessie Begley in your prayers. She uh, made it back home from the hospital uh, after being hospitalized with COVID symptoms, and uh, she's now reportedly at home but still feeling pretty weak, so uh, do, do keep praying for her recovery. Uh, James Greer posted that uh, a friend of his named Steve Sloan, who also has uh, a set of twins, twin boys, the three of them are all COVID positive, and uh, James requested that we uh, add them to our prayer list, so let's go ahead and, and do that. Um, as far as sick go, that's, that's all I've got. Is there anybody else that we need to mention tonight that's on the sick list? Yes, Bill. Okay. Okay. Um, just in case somebody couldn't hear Bill, I've got the microphone on here. Um, one of uh, the directors at Baywac, where uh, where Laura works. Uh, his name is Rick Pratt, and his father passed away, um, and they've asked us to, uh, you know, pray for, pray for that family. So we're sorry to hear that, Laura, and we'll, we'll be praying. All right, a um, couple of up, uh, upcoming events. Uh, if you can help move the Gizzlebaugh's furniture into their new home on Saturday at 10 a.m., uh, we'll be meeting up at the storage facility where they've, where they've got their... Uh, goods stored. It's called Bearcat Storage on Dixie Highway in Florence. And if you need more information about how to get there or uh, anything else about that, see Brian. Uh, but 10 o'clock Saturday morning, just meet at the storage facility and, uh, and we'll start getting that furniture moved into their house. That's exciting. Uh, we had scheduled the uh, training class, first aid CPR training class for this coming Sunday, the 21st, but it is being postponed one week to the 28th and uh, so if you're signed up just keep you know keep yourself signed up and switch it for one week but it'll be two o'clock Sunday afternoon February 28th instead of two o'clock this coming Sunday uh, we're looking forward to that and then there's a ladies retreat on March 26 27 there is a sign-up sheet out in the foyer Jerry's trying to uh, get it get an idea of how many people want to uh, attend so please if you're planning on attending help Jerry and Jennifer out to plan this thing, get your name on the list. Um, and if you have questions, see, see Jerry or Jennifer. Um, no news yet, someone might ask, uh, no news yet on when they're rescheduling the um, baby shower for uh, my daughter Olivia and grandson Elias. I love saying that, my grandson Elias. Uh, so just stay tuned for that. Um, but at some point, uh, they will be able to travel up here, and, uh, and we'll be able to, to uh, have that event for them. Um, I think that, oh, Sunday, March 7th, mark it on your calendars. That's the Sunday that we start uh, having uh, morning, Sunday morning Bible class again, uh, same time as we used to have it, 930. So it'll be 930 class, 1030 worship. And um, everyone will just go to class. We won't have the, uh, the singing and prayer before class like we used to do. We're just going to have everybody start out in the classrooms. 
And our adult class will be on the book of Daniel. Uh, Brian will be teaching that class for us. So we're looking forward to uh, just two more Sundays. And then, then uh, March 7th, we'll be, we'll be back in class. All right, are there any other announcements that we need to make? Steve. And is, it, is there a, a family name we can mention or any, any additional detail? I guess uh, Beth is out teaching class, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep it in the Okay. All right, so there will, there's a family that's going to be visiting with us, and we want to be praying for that family. They're going through some struggles with health. Okay. Perfect. We're looking forward to, to seeing them and meeting them. All right. Anything else? Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've blessed us with. And Father, we thank you for, uh, even though it's cold outside, and we just we know, Father, that there are uh, many who are struggling right now that, uh, that don't have electricity and um, don't have heat. And we just pray, Father, that you would, would watch over them and, uh, and help them at this time. We're thankful for... Uh, those of my relatives that have that have had their uh, electricity uh, come back on today, and just pray, Father, that you would continue to uh, to watch over all of those that are struggling through these these winter uh, storms that we're having in the cold uh, weather that's that's affected most of the country. Uh, we pray for this nation, Father, and and just pray that you would help us to, uh, as a people, strive to do your will and and have leaders, Father, that would lead us in in the right way. Uh, and we pray that, that uh, our leaders would be uh, making wise decisions for us. And we know, Father, that uh, ultimately you are in control and, and uh, you rule in the affairs of men. And we, we need to serve you first and foremost. And we pray that we will always do that. Uh, Father, we pray for those that are uh, on the, the sick list and, and just pray that you would, would bless them, um, help Jesse, help Sandy. Um, continue to be with uh, James Greer's friends, uh, those that we know of that have uh, that are impacted by the coronavirus, and just pray that uh, that they would all be able to make a full recovery. Uh, we pray for this family that will be visiting with us on Sunday, and uh, pray that we might uh, reach out to them and, and welcome them, and just pray also, Father, that uh, that the things that they're dealing with, um, that they will will find the strength and, and courage to, uh, to deal with those and that, that you would uplift them and, and help them. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with us tonight as we offer worship to you and as we uh, look into your word and, and uh, study a portion of it that we might grow this evening, Father, in, in understanding and, and, Father, be encouraged as we gather together here tonight. Uh, to, to carry on doing your will and, and the work of the church in this area. We are thankful, Father, for all those that are out tonight, but we also, Father, know that many, uh, many are staying home uh, to be safe and just pray that you would watch over and bless them, and, and we pray that uh, conditions will improve and they'll be able to be back with us very soon. Uh, Father, we, we know that there are times when we sin and fall short, and we pray that you would would forgive us. We are thankful, Father, uh, for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us, and we are thankful, Father, that you loved us so much that you sent him to this earth to be the sacrifice that, that had to be made for us. Please forgive us of our sins, Father, and, and help us to each day to strive to do your will. And uh, we are thankful, Father, that you, that you have given us your will in your word and, and just pray that we would always look to it. Uh, we ask, Father, that you go with us at this time in, into worship, and we are thankful, Father, for this, for this ability tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal, trust in who leads you, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust in me, shame, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Bible study. Great to see you, I would say, maybe in different circumstances that, well, this is the cream of the crop to be here tonight in all this cold and ice and snow, but we all know that there are people who are watching online or will be watching this Bible study a little bit later on online, and uh, brothers and sisters who would be with us here tonight if they possibly could be, and they're just not able to to be here. So the cream of the crop are those who continue in their faith and their spiritual resilience in spite of obstacles. 
uh, in their way. And that would include all of us and those who may be watching online. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Those of you who, who, uh, who, who made the, uh, the, went through the struggles and the challenges to be here this evening, like me and, 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 and like you. Um, we're studying the book of Philippians, turning your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. We're still in Philippians. We kind of have these little bit of fits and starts. We didn't have a Bible study last week, if you recall, but I won't do too much review. I do want to read here verses 18, or rather verse 12 through 18, and then I want to just go right in after reading this text, 18 through, or rather verse 12 through 18, and just go right in to talking about some of the lessons that, uh, that we can learn from these verses without really talking so much about the verses themselves. And then hopefully later on, uh, we'll have time to look at verses 19 through uh, 26. So Paul writes this, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of fear, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So a great text and one that we need to give consideration to, and we have been actually for the last couple of weeks. So Paul says a number of important things. He's going to continue to say important things as we look uh, at the verses that follow, verses 19 through 26. I, I, I kind of, a couple of uh, weeks ago, or at the beginning of this series, I thought about well, different lesson points or perspectives uh, or angles uh, by which we could look at the book of Philippians. And I, uh, I mentioned the fact that, that we need to be thinking about uh, leadership lessons, fellowship and edification lessons, uh, personal spiritual edification uh, type lessons, fellowship lessons or edification lessons, and spiritual warfare lessons as we think about uh, the text before us here. And I have several that I want to share with you, and hopefully uh, maybe there are some that you would like to share with me as well, because as we study God's Word, we need to be extracting from that Word lessons that we can put into action and put into play in our own lives. I'll start with a couple of of evangelism and church growth lessons. When I, you can't help but study this text without thinking of evangelism and church growth, because this is certainly Paul's focus as uh, he is writing to the Philippian Christians. Certainly, one lesson is that the advance of the gospel needs to be, please understand and appreciate my emphasis here needs to be the major consideration in all of our experiences, good or bad. <clears throat> the Philippian believers themselves, they're not in prison, but they are facing some opposition uh, to their lives as believers in the great city of Philippi. But Paul especially is under some kind of confinement. He refers to himself as being in chains. And yet, Paul is not sitting in prison or sitting in a confined situation thinking, woe is me, um, the end has come with me preaching the gospel. There's no, nothing for me to do. If I could only get out of, of this prison, uh, then I would be free to, to speak for Christ. But what do we find Paul doing? Well, well, what's he doing here in these chains? Well, he's preaching the gospel. And he's speaking to the palace guards because they have souls and they have significance. He's, he's preaching the gospel to anyone who will listen to him. And apparently there are some willing to listen to what he has to say. We need to make this our focus as well. You know, look at the obstacles that are in front of us. You know, Sometimes we have health issues 
that we're dealing with, this um, uh, COVID pandemic that we're looking at. And, and don't you know, don't you know that we come into contact with people daily, if, if not daily, then almost daily, with people who are having struggles in their lives and we can relate to them as human beings, as caring people, and we can talk to them about the most important thing we could talk about. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That really does need to be on our hearts. That really does need to be in front of us at all times. That's what Paul was doing. I guess we could say, well, we're not going, I'm not going to be the Apostle Paul. You know, no one can be as good as him as a believer, as a faithful servant of God. But actually, that's not true. Paul never, he never suggests to the Philippian believers or the Corinthians or the Ephesians or anyone else that he's preaching to, he never says to them, you know, you can never reach the level of maturity that I've reached. He never even makes that suggestion, never even hints at it. Because actually, in our time and in our own unique situation and circumstances, why can't we reach that level of maturity? Why can't we reach the point that in our experiences, that we too can make the gospel of Christ and advancing that gospel the focus of our lives? What else are we going to do in our relationships? All right, what else are we going to do? What else are we going to do as far as inserting value into those relationships? except teach people the gospel so that we can go to heaven and they can go to heaven. That's the greatest gift you can give a friend or a loved one. What lessons do you see in, in, this, in these texts, in these verses? Any others? Fellowship, or fellowship lessons, edification lessons, spiritual growth lessons? Yes, Bill, please. And speak up, Bill, please. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Okay. Always opportunities. We have to look for them. So easy to look at our lives and think, you know, I don't have any opportunities. I'm just sitting here waiting for opportunities to come my way. <laughs> wrong, wrong. Those opportunities will come your way, but you go looking for them so that you meet those opportunities and you serve the Lord in that way. Yeah. You know, even in times of isolation, we're not really isolated. We, we may say we are, we may convince ourselves that we're isolated. And, and maybe we're more isolated than maybe someone else. But we need to get out. We need to talk to people. We need to converse with people and spread the gospel. Anybody else? Because I have a couple of, I got a couple more. All right. Think about this one. In all things, and one of the things that Paul does here in this text is he talks about the fact that there are others preaching the gospel. Paul's under confinement. Uh, but he's still preaching the gospel. And he says, all of the, you know, all the brethren, you know, they, they rejoice in, in what's happening to me and in what I'm doing and in the advancement of the gospel. And he says that, that there are different ones preaching the gospel and they have different motives and, and that kind of thing. In all things, let's rejoice that Christ is preached, that Christ is magnified, even at our expense. Okay, even if we're the ones paying the price or paying the cost, let's rejoice that Christ is being preached. Again, let me say it with, with greater emphasis, even if it is at our expense. 
Let's rejoice that Christ is preached. You know, we, have, we often have no control others, over what others do. We don't have control over what others say. Paul doesn't have any control about the preachers that he's talking about in this text. He doesn't have any control about their motives or what they're saying or what they're doing. Hopefully, hopefully, all we can pray about and hope for is that some good will be done somehow. And the Lord who knows all things, the Lord who controls all things, will see to it that the gospel is advanced. The Lord wants the gospel to be advanced. And we should be with His program. You know, I was, um, I was raised in a denominational church. wasn't raised in the Lord's church. But it was in that denominational church, and, and I don't judge their motives. I don't believe their teaching, but um, some of what they were teaching was the truth. And it was in those Bible classes as a little kid that I learned about Noah, and I learned about Moses, and I learned about Jesus, and I learned many of the great stories and lessons of the Bible. And those things formed my personality and helped to form my thinking about the Bible. I'm thankful for those people. I'm thankful. I think uh, I remember Mrs. Taylor when I was about second or third grade. She was my Bible class teacher. And I'm grateful for the lessons that she taught uh, me. And how great it is, you know, that we have people who are teaching our, our children's Bible classes and our teenage Bible classes. And, you know, we don't have control over so much of what people do. But if good is being done, let's be thankful for at least that. Let's be thankful for that. And hopefully, people in learning the Scriptures will come out on the side of truth. And there is absolutely no question that the lessons that I learned in that denominational church, in those Bible classes, and this was a church of about 200, 250. It had a huge building, I remember, at least as a kid. You know, everything's bigger when you're a kid. But, you know, I remember learning those great lessons uh, uh, and, and learning those vacation Bible school songs. And I, and I remember the great truths that I was taught that God is to be worshipped, that God is to be honored, and we are to follow only Jesus Christ. And those lessons stuck with me and continue with me even today. Well, I can do all the talking. I don't have to do all the talking tonight. But anyway, we're just looking at lessons that we learn here from verses 12 through about verse 18. I can think of some leadership lessons. Uh, leaders need to inspire confidence. We see Paul doing that here. Paul is inspiring confidence of the Philippian brethren. You know, if Paul is in prison or is he, if he is in confinement, that has the potential of causing the brethren to look at him and say, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is hard. This Christianity, it's, it's hard to be a Christian. Maybe we need to slow down. Maybe we need to back off. You know, they could take that point of view, but Paul didn't want them uh, to go down that road. Paul wanted them to have confidence in him and the Lord working in him and the gospel still being advanced. He wanted them to have confidence as believers and as Christians. Notice, if you will, at the beginning of this text, but I want you to know, brethren, boy, this is the language of leadership here. I want the brethren to know I want them to know this, and I want them to know this. And, and Paul, in fact, throughout this whole uh, text in verses 12 through verse 26, Paul uses the language of confidence. He says in verse 12, I want you to know. Uh, he talks about knowing in verse uh, 17. He says, for I know in verse 19. He talks about in verse 20, my earnest expectation. I'm, I'm sure about this, Paul is saying. And then in verse 25, he says, and being confident of this, I know. 
So Paul uses these confidence words, I know, these certainty words. That's the language that we need leadership uh, to use. And uh, that's, the comp- that's the language we need our preachers to use. I know this. This is what's right. This is what is expected. This is what the Lord would, would have us to do. You know, uh, sometimes Beth and I make, or, or I make the joke sometimes with Beth, sometimes that, uh, I, you know, I don't want to be like the preacher who gives a long sermon and uh, then kind of ends it uh, like the one preacher did with, but then again, what do I know? You know, we don't want to have that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of language or uh, that kind of, of uh, uh, focus where we don't really know what it is that we're talking about. I think of some personal and spiritual growth lessons. Don't get discouraged because circumstances become a little bit troubling. They were troubling for Paul. They could have been for the Philippian brethren. But don't get discouraged. Paul didn't want the Philippian believers to become discouraged because he was in prison. And he seems to be quite happy and quite pleased that even though he is in prison, it seems like there are some of his preaching brethren who are saying, well, you know what? We need to pour it on even more. We need to preach the gospel even more. And Paul seems quite pleased about that. Sometimes we suffer for our faith. Sometimes we suffer. God does not promise to spare us from suffering. And in fact, in some of the verses that we're going to be looking at, Paul even says that God grants it to us that we will suffer, that we will face adversity. And then there are some spiritual warfare lessons Sometimes, sometimes negative experiences can turn out for the furtherance of the gospel or some other spiritual benefit. It's pretty clear that that's not what Satan wants to happen. He wants adversity. He wants our negative experiences to, to cause the gospel uh, uh, to, 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 to hold back and to not be preached. That's the effect that he wants these things to have. We need to always uh, check our motives. Paul talks about this in this section of Scripture. Always check our motives. We should serve the Lord out of goodwill, out of love, and out of sincerity, and hope that God will bring about good from those who serve God, even from false motives. We said this, I think, two weeks ago. You know, there are many motives that we can have for doing good things. Let's always be willing to examine ourselves and to check ourselves and make sure that our motives are, uh, are pleasing uh, in God's sight. Anybody else want to add anything as far as lessons that we can learn? All right, Bill, please, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? I love that comment. That's, we need to be bigger in our vision. We need to see the bigger picture. We need to see what God is seeing. God sees the future. And He knows that what we do today can have an impact even hundreds of years later. Great point. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. So something that happened 75 years ago, a decision that happened 20, 75 years ago is still having positive effects even today. The great, very good, very good comment. Let's go on and look at, um, at the verses that follow. Moving on, look at verses 19 through 26. Paul says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Because remember, he's, he's under confinement at this point. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. I love this section of Scripture and follows after this other section of Scripture that I love and adore. Their prayers, Paul says in verses 19 and 20, he says their prayers would bring deliverance and fruitful results. And it's clear that Paul's situation and the Philippian situations were tied together. Their fellowship in the gospel, remember he mentions that in verse 5 just a few verses ago, their fellowship in the gospel. And interestingly, Paul's words in this text are a mixture. Did you notice it? Did you pick up on it? A mixture of certainty and also uncertainty. Certainty and uncertainty. There are some things that Paul was confident about. Again, verse 19, he says, for I know. And in verse 20, he says, for my earnest expectation. And then in verse 25, he says, and being confident of this, I know. But then compare that with verse 12 when he says, but I want you to know. And then in verse 19, for I know. Again, here's the language of certainty. But there is also uncertainty on Paul's part. When he says in verse 22, yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. And then in verses 23 and 24, he says, for I am hard pressed between the two. Now he mentions here deliverance. And what kind of deliverance is he talking about in this text? What's interesting about that is when you study the text is that he mentions really two kinds of deliverance. First of all, there is deliverance from imprisonment. So Paul can be released from prison in Rome if that's where he's at, and he can travel back to Philippi and meet the Philippian brethren. So deliverance from imprisonment seems to be the meaning in verse 25. And also if you jump ahead to chapter 2, verse 24, that is suggested there as well. I'm, he says, I want to come to you. I plan to come to you. But also, there is another kind of deliverance. And what's that? Deliverance from life to heaven. 
which seems to be his meaning in verse 23. And again, if you jump forward to chapter 30 or chapter 3 and verse 20. Now, it's easy to suggest that Paul has both deliverances in mind. If I had been the Apostle Paul, I would have been a little bit more clear about which deliverance I was meaning. Okay? But Paul doesn't want to be. And the Holy Spirit doesn't want him to be. Deliverance is deliverance. And sometimes it has this understanding and sometimes it has the other. He gave them credit, you'll notice. He gives them credit for his deliverance because of their prayers in his behalf in verse 19. By the way, this is very similar, and we have time to look at this. This is very similar to Paul's words over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, follow me over there for just a minute. Again, you'll be impressed in your study of the Bible that the Bible, as I've said before, it repeats itself so many times, okay? Just using different words. Paul does that all the time, repeats himself, but he uses different words. Look at this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. We thought we were going to die. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Now just hold on just a minute. We have the sentence of death in ourselves. Let me ask, just ask you, do you live your life like you have the sentence of death in yourself? Do you live your life like that? Paul lived his life every single day. I, I, he, he could get up every morning and think, maybe today's going to be the day. Maybe today's going to be the day when I'm killed, when I'm murdered, when I'm persecuted, um, when I'm hung up. For the gospel of Christ. Paul lived for the Lord as a given that today could be the day of his martyrdom. Yes, we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Meaning God is the one who has life and, and the power of life who delivered us from so great of death. Okay, so God has done this before. He's delivered Paul out of the jaws of death. He delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust that He will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So Paul is thanking the Corinthians for praying for him and praying for his deliverance. God is able to deliver him and will deliver him in the future. But, but Paul knows that God has delivered him again and again and again. But there is coming a day when he will no longer deliver him and he will be killed. Paul knows this as he's writing to the Philippian church. And he knows this as he's writing to the Corinthians. Imagine, if you will, and our time is up, but imagine living your life like that every single day. <clears throat> when you live your life like that every single day, then you know, you know that every day comes with a price. Every day comes with a cost. If you know that you could die just at any hour or any day, that, 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 kind, of, that kind of gives new value and new meaning to every minute and every hour that you live. It gives you a different kind of perspective about the value of life. It gives you a different perspective on what you ought to be doing with your life. 
Why is it that when there's a great storm like a hurricane or a tornado or something and someone's home is destroyed or business is destroyed and, 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 but, 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 but the family's safe. You know, they made it through the storm. And how often do they say, well, we lost everything, but everybody's okay. What a great perspective that is. Because you now see maybe in a way that you never did before, that what really matters is family, friends. And let's just take that to to another level. What really matters are souls. That's what really matters. Eternity is in front of us. You know, it's real. It's there. We are all citizens of eternity. It's in front of us. We as God's people, as believers in Jesus, we have that understanding. We have that perspective. We, we've got to make sure we never let that go. If you're here tonight, and you haven't been thinking in that way like you should, I hope that today you'll begin thinking every single day, today could be the last day. What's most valuable to me? What's most important to me? Relationships, the people in my life, and the health of my soul, and the health of others, their souls as well. This is what really should matter for all of us. The health of your soul is, that's why Jesus came. That's why he died on the cross. And that's why he was resurrected so that you could have life in his name. Jesus knows the value of the soul. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. You have an opportunity tonight to come back to him, to be obedient to him, and to start having his perspective on your life and on the lives of others. This is what the world needs. Men and women who care about others, who care about the Lord, and who are willing to pay the price to share the gospel with friends and neighbors, family members. We've got to start caring about souls. Care about your own soul tonight, okay? In obedience to the gospel of Christ, why don't you come back to him as we stand and sing the song of invitation.